might take a minute to show up there, but <clears throat> just took my first sip of my quote unquote morning coffee. Good morning, everybody. We are live on this gorgeous morning. It's Ted Bogert with the Ted Show and the one and only, and I'm honored to have him, Dr. Roland Roberts. How are you? Good morning. Great for you, Ted. Good morning. I am good today. Yeah, I mean, every day it's uh, a good day. And I'm going to just look down for a little bit to share the show. But I think a lot of my followers, you've never been on the show before, so a lot of my followers will not or might not know you. So can you give them a little background on you um, before we take a deep dive into uh, the topic? Sure. Grew up in West Virginia, a great place, uh, small town, and uh, went off to college, uh, did ended up doing very well, realized I had a knack in business and uh, specifically real estate investing and uh, and then ended up losing the millions that I did uh, through there by the time I was 22 years old. And um, wow, how did you lose the millions? I'm fascinated <laughs> by that. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, you know, there's the, the, some of the greatest losses in my life have been the uh, foundation that uh, that really form, formed formed uh, who I am, and uh, so who how someone handles pain and loss really defines them. Um, they say two things really define a man: who they are when they have everything, and who they are when they have nothing, uh, for different reasons. But uh, so I, I did very well. But I grew up very naive, a, a very s small town. Like I said, we had a three-way stop sign in one three-way stop sign in my town, uh, <laughs> in the, the, the main intersection. Then they made it a blinking light whenever I was a senior in high school, and now it's an actual stoplight. Uh, big time. It's yeah, big time so, now. <laughs> but I grew up, you know, with hard work and values and ethics and integrity, you know, being the the, the cornerstone. And uh, went off to college and, uh, and and got a job actually in a telemarketing environment. Uh, but I, they were paying me six bucks an hour, and I thought I hit the jackpot. So I literally <laughs> started going, uh, studying, reading every book I could at the bookstore because I couldn't afford to buy them at the time. But I would just sit there all day Saturday and read until they closed uh, all the books I could on investing. And after about three months of doing that, I thought, why am I sitting here? I just, I just need to go do it. And uh, so I bought my first house, sold it 30 minutes later because I already had a buyer lined up. Um, so I never actually even took possession um, of that back to back closings. And that gave me the, uh, the, the whatever it was, uh, 10, $12,000 that I needed to then use my own down payment money instead of credit card advances and uh, <laughs> uh, there's the secret right there. That was the old it. days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, so I, I made it um, over the next few years while I was in college. And uh, the agent that I used more from just a real estate agent to my my uh, my power of attorney over my entire life. Literally, I signed power of attorney uh, to the degree that he got to choose what clothes I wore, what cell phone plan I had, what phone, what devices I used, where I went, when I went there. I literally outsourced because I thought that's what rich people do. Remember, I'm this poor boy from the from West, right? Uh, I, th I just thought that rich people had handlers and you just do what they tell you to do and they'll make you even more money. And uh, and I and, and he gladly assumed that role <laughs> to have that much authority over someone. But um but but that came to, to bite me whenever I got a call uh, from the bank uh, one day saying uh, I had a nearly a million dollar construction loan due as a 12 month note and uh, I'd built another 12 or whatever units to add on to some small apartment complex I'd bought and uh, and I said okay just transfer the money you know from the account just pay it pay it from the account and they said uh, they said well it, it's not there and you know they had said that to me like two other times and so I, and they always just looked at the wrong account or, you know, whatever. So I didn't panic at that point. And I just said, no, go back and look and just pay it from the account. And they said, no, you don't understand. You know, so-and-so came in this morning and, uh, or, or, you know, he, he withdrew it all, whatever it was last night or, or that wow. morning. And I said, you gotta be kidding. So I started trying to call him for the first time in three years. I couldn't get a hold of him for the first time. And um, uh, it was probably about an hour and a half, two hours later, I got a call from the FBI asking if I knew where he was. I said, no, but if you find him, let me know. And, I, and they started saying, well, we know where your money is and you'll never see it again. And uh, I, I literally, I'm what, 22 years old, 21 years old. I start crying like a baby. I'm like, well, what do I do? You know, I would have. Yeah. You, you had, you had grown this business. You, he was just handling it. Well, obviously he was handling a lot more. That's, a, that's, that's terrible. Yeah, but you know, it, it taught me a lesson that I needed to learn, which was be careful who you trust. 
And, um, you know, when you grow up in a handshake kind of uh, environment and with a certain set of principles, it was a very tough lesson for me to learn that not everybody operates um, out of uh, out of good intentions and out of honesty and integrity. So um, that, you know, that was a that was a lesson I needed to learn in order to do the things that I've done. And obviously now I, I work with uh, advise world governments. I, I, I was an advisor on the US China trade war. Uh, I would one of like two Americans that have ever addressed the Chinese Communist Congress uh, 16 months ago in the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Um, you know, I got back from Africa a little over a month ago, um, working with uh, the Rwandan governments, Ethiopian governments, Kenyan governments, you know, just different, uh, different countries on national security initiatives, defense. I mean, it's amazing. And I have to let the viewers know, if you go to uh, Roland's LinkedIn page, everything that he's listing here, uh, it's uh, it's a little bit intimidating because in a positive way, like you're just in awe. There's so much that you did. And I had to read a few of the sentences a few times and look up a few words just to make sure I understood exactly what we were talking about. But how do you go from 22 and the guys taking all of your money to presenting in front of the communist government of China? Yeah, you know, there, there was... Um... I had to go get a job after I lost everything. <laughs> so, uh, and that job uh, led me to, there. it ended up, the, they literally, it was a bad experience. They ended up shutting the doors on lunchtime, literally. So I, th I, I thought, well, this is exactly why I didn't go the workforce route uh, and ended up getting a job um, with, a, with a large multi-billion dollar publicly held company. And um, it was more entry level than anything. Uh, it was client service kind of work, you know, I, uh, so, uh, but I did, uh, three months later, get promoted to a vice president, uh, position and ended up growing that division to 1500 employees that I had. Um, and so I wasn't yet 25 years old. I couldn't rent a car from Hertz, uh, but was doing all of this travel, <laughs> uh, but, but that really kicked off, uh, what has become one of the cornerstones and hallmarks of my career, which is crisis management, because, uh, in 2006, we were the first ones to go public with a data breach. Before then, no company ever talked about a data breach. We were the first to go public. Part of what happened because we disclosed it was we had to negotiate with the FTC. We had to pay a hefty fine. We negotiate, uh, testified before Congress. And, uh, and, but we also helped write the legislation that required everybody else to disclose uh, when there's a data breach. And so uh, uh, that was a, a phenomenal experience. Um, the stock had gone from $46 a share to $11 a share. I mean, that's the kind of numbers people take their life over, you know, and uh, it took two years and um, we were able to get that stock back to $48 a share. And, but it was a, an incredible crisis response. And I was tasked with leading that effort for those two years. And then I left and became the CEO of, or into a technology company and then uh, eventually became the CEO of a uh, four they, at their height. They were $400 million uh, nutraceutical for a manufacturing company. And, um, uh, did that until 2012, ran, uh, did, did a few other things. I've written, you know, four books uh, that have sold, uh, uh, a couple of them sold over a million copies in 24 languages. But then I became the CEO of the Hoverboard Company, which is what most people <laughs> kind of know know me as. Um, uh, and that became the single hottest uh, consumer product in the world uh, in 2015. So the whole time you're talking, of course, I'm in awe because I'm feeling like I'm an underachiever right at this moment. <laughs> But um, but but the thing that uh, comes across immediately to me is you have all of these high level, high stress positions, and yet you have such a calm, like you're calm. You, I mean, you can't really fake calm. Um, I can tell when somebody's nerve, really nervous or very stressed out, and I'm sure you have your moments. But where's the calm come from? Where are you, I mean, is that how you always are? Is that how you are when you're dealing with people or presenting in China? Uh, you just have this very calm uh, demeanor and this calm spirit. Yes, um, I would say that that is not natural for me. Uh, that, I, that, was, that is a learned behavior. Uh, when I was played high school basketball, uh, my, my parents really worked hard with me on being able to control my attitude and control my temper because I wanted to win so bad, so bad that if someone else wasn't pulling their weight or a team member, you know, uh, made a bonehead play or something. I mean, I, I struggled with it. And the other thing that they said I really struggled with was if, if the 
was when the referee wasn't consistent. I didn't mind unfair calls. I just wanted you to be consistently unfair or be consistently fair, but don't be d different to, in different times. Right. And th that has really tr carried on into the, my business life uh, where when I see people taken advantage of, that disturbs me the most. Uh, when I see them deceived, that really bothers me, uh, which means I live in a interesting state whenever I'm working with governments where the conversations are in, uh, intentional deception, not outright lies, but intentional deception. Uh, I'm not lying, but I'm not, uh, I'm not telling the truth, but I'm not lying. And so they see this gray world. Uh, but I think if, uh, if they are intentionally omitting, they lied by what they knew that they did not. That's disinformation, not misinformation. Um, so whenever we're dealing with information wars, uh, words matter. Uh, but, but there is a, a deep internal piece. Um, but it came, uh, Ted, from uh, losing everything it got things had to get so bad for me that and, and even then it needed to be bad for an extended period of time um after i lost everything sleeping in my car for for nearly over a year um and not you know knowing what a negative bank account is like knowing what having your phone cut off is like knowing what having your utilities cut off um is like uh trying to figure out where you're going to go take a shower, uh, how you're going to uh, make a, a job interview on Skype or, or, you know, something with a free number. Um, but finally getting to the end of myself uh, so that I could just surrender um, and be led. And, and here's one of the, the, the big differences. The first half of my life and especially my career, I was trying to make things happen. And that's one of the most popular mantras. I, I was, uh, they brought me in to do a lot of speaking in the motivational sectors, you know, and, um, but the answer to real success and big success is not making things happen because whatever you make happen will unhappen for you as well. Um, there are certain things that, and especially the more talent you have, the better you are, the more you can make things happen, but that you probably should not make happen. So I made a lot of things happen, um, but they didn't last because I never should have made them happen. Uh, <laughs> I, and I don't know if that makes sense, but there, there's, Absolutely there's one story. Makes sense. That's exactly how I ended up in the Great Hall of the People. I told one of my partners, um, uh, I, I told him, do not reach out to, he wanted to start marketing in certain, in certain ways or places. I said, no, no, don't do that. We've done a lot of that, you know, when I was in my 20s. That's not, that's not what is needed right now. We just need to be still. And uh, people that we don't even know will be, you know, will, will reach out. We just have to wait. Uh, and here's the hard thing for people to understand. We have such a logical mind and we're used to this career path and career progression of promotions. Uh, but the way life actually works is you could be at the very back of the line and go to the very front of the line. So Life, true. it doesn't follow this, uh, the, the, the made up man-made hierarchy of corporate promotion. Uh, life operates very different. And look at any entertainer or artist um, that goes from, a, from, from playing in, in bars and clubs to you know, being a breakout superstar. Uh, it, it wasn't a gradual progression. It was them doing what they are supposed to do where they can and letting life take care of itself in that in that regard. So I have to add, I'm, and I'm fascinated. I definitely want you to come back on, please. We have plenty of time. I just, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, wow, there's so much to talk about because I have all sorts of AI questions for you too. Right. And, uh, <laughs> but I don't know if we're going to get to that today, but I want to ask you about Courageous. So you have, you've created a Courageous, courageous initiative uh, courageous where amazing happens, which I love. So can you talk about where, how that all came into play and why that word courageous is important? Yes. Um, you know, one of the main things uh, that we struggle with in life and business is fear and uh, what, whatever it's over, fear of the unknown or what have you, but, but fear is a, is a crippler. Uh, fear 
you know, as according to the the the, the movie uh, Spartacus or whatever it was, uh, you know, that is the reason no one will know your name. <laughs> you know, and uh, I worked a lot with entrepreneurs around the world, uh, and 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 so the biggest challenge in working with entrepreneurs and business people is not that they don't know what to do. Most of the time, I can go in any boardroom and even a failing company, I would ask the executives, what do we need to do? And they'd give me the list that they still had not done. And it's not that people don't know what to do, it's that they are scared to do it most of the time. Uh, so that's where the idea kind of came from. But the it was broader than even the name. I wanted it to be a place. I wanted Courageous to be a place where where whether it was dignitaries, uh, world, you know, global diplomats uh, from foreign governments uh, or our own, and um, and you know, business leaders and executives could come, and entrepreneurs could come, and uh, just like because if if when I had time with people, it was we were always able to transform their their business, you know, which obviously usually transforms their life as well, and so that's where you know my my personal faith. And the skill set of, of growing businesses kind of merged. It was the place of be strong and courageous, fear not, you know. And so that's kind of the premise that, that where courageous came from. And we still, things were happening that we couldn't explain. It, meaning uh, people were like, I never thought this would, I, you know, this could happen for me. Or I didn't think this business could, could, could get to this place or that this would happen in my career or make this much money, whatever it was. And uh, so we didn't know how else to describe it other than words that we were hearing, which is, hey, this is where amazing happens. <laughs> Love it. I want to I want to talk about Courageous now, because obviously uh, that your Courageous initiative has been around for a while, but we are in a new world right now, a, a developing, emerging world uh, from quarantine to hopefully reopening at some point, And that's a whole nother topic. But what are you finding or what are you seeing or how can you give maybe some advice on, especially in the small business arena, those to me seem like the people that are suffering the most, the small business owners, the restaurants. Um, there's been so many people been furloughed and laid off. Um, what kind of, how, how can they be courageous? What, what steps can they do to stay positive and really kind of prepare for what's coming next? Yeah, those are a lot of great questions. Um, and and I, I think that understanding you know, all wisdom comes uh, with wisdom comes discernment and, and, and seeking out this wisdom and discernment. And, and these are times where discernment is one of the greatest skills to have. Uh, there's a lot of positive people that are positively crazy or positively, you know, uh, <laughs> insane. Um, and so I, I am less concerned about positive. I don't want negative. I don't want the opposite of that. I'm more focused on, can I, can I find some discerning people? Uh, discerning entrepreneurs. Let's be wise. Um, and, and there are ways to do all of it. I think that uh, b obviously businesses have to adapt. You've always had to adapt. And I'm kind the the only one of the things I'm grateful for, if I choose to see the positive of what's happened, is that there are some initiatives in, in enterprise that have needed to happen for years. And I've been beating my head against a wall for 10 years trying to get uh, the, the healthcare community to go to telemedicine. Uh, you know, in Spain, uh, doctors would be smacked if they ever said, you need to come to my office. <laughs> what an arrogant jerk, you know, like, in Spain, they still make the house calls because if you're sick, you don't feel like going anywhere. You know? So there's a logic to it. Whereas we started doing more of the cattle car concept of, you know, one place and you, you just bring all the sick people together. Uh, we're kind of learning now with social distancing. Maybe that wasn't the smartest idea in the world, but, uh, but telemedicine is, is, is clearly makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, j just like in many cases, teleworking does. Uh, and to show how woefully unprepared the largest companies in the world were for, for teleworking, uh, we tried to, we were uh, converting our call centers uh, at over a thousand call center agents in two, from 2003 to 2007. And I, and I had started a virtual call center in 2015. We're completely virtual to prove to Westgate Resorts, for example, for one, that it could be done. Um, because everyone wanted to give you all of the, the reasons it won't work. And when I say everyone, I mean the people, you know, with very small minds that have just kind of been there and go to work and show up every day. They're not uh, reinventing and reimagining entire industries on a regular basis. And, uh, 
And so I did it just for the fun of it. Uh, had uh, 300 agents hired around the country uh, within three weeks and trained um, and able to take calls uh, for them, lead generation calls. And so, uh, but yet I was on the phone with Chase Bank this morning and, uh, you know, their wire transfer department is uh, unavailable until further notice, right? They can't even do wow. telework. Uh, one of the top five banks in the world. Uh, the uh, the first time I called, I had to hang up because the lady working from home, her Wi-Fi was so bad, it was the call was so crackly, and I finally get somebody who had a clear connection. That's the, it's like we're operating in you know 1999, and these are some of the major <laughs> corporations. So from that perspective, I'm glad that everyone who revered and respected some of these entities, like they were the great Wizard of Oz, the curtain's been pulled back and see what a sham, you know, that the emperor has no clothes. Uh, and, and so I'm grateful from that perspective that I think it will incite change. And I think the small business man, a person really is, has the greatest advantage during this time. The big companies do not. What I have shared, one of the greatest ways to win, it's what Apple did, it's what Microsoft did, it's what Uber did. The greatest way to, the only way for a small business to beat a big business in normal times, the only way to win is if you change the rules of the game. You cannot beat them playing their own by their rules. If I was going to play Michael Jordan basketball, we can't win if I play by his rules, i.e. the rules of basketball. We have to play by a new set of rules, which maybe who doesn't score at all, you know, right? <laughs> but, but the point is you have to change the rules of the game. And same thing in business. And so the rules are changing, which means the small business person can adapt a whole lot easier. I love seeing what, you know, the delivery businesses. I love seeing the, um, uh, you know, little businesses like Plato's Closet, find, you know, they have an online store now. Instead, You know, they've had to to develop where they were stagnant before. Um, and, and the service industry, uh, the service industry, uh, you know, cash is always a great thing. And this, there's no better way for someone. Maybe they're unemployed. Maybe they've lost their job or furloughed. Um, and I encourage them to start start a service business. You don't need to invent something. You do not need to go figure out a patent and come up with the next big idea and solve some major problem. You need to go clean some houses for 50 bucks a house or, or, or 40 bucks an hour or whatever you do um, and get yourself 10, 20, 30 houses a week, or you need to go mow some lawns, or you need to start doing a, starting a, a, a laundromat out of your house. You go pick up the clothes from different people who don't want to wash or iron or fold or whatever. Um, and, and you know, capture some of these, some of these needs and niches um, that don't go away. The grass still grows, you know, regardless <laughs> of a it's shutdown. True. It's so true. I think a lot of, I, I feel like people are, uh, if you have a creative bone in your body anywhere, you are being challenged to express that creativity. And I feel like a lot of people are, you know, they're, they're poning up to the bar. They're figuring it out. They're trying yeah. to do the positive. And I think that's so critical um, the ones that are still, you know, the sky is falling, which look guys, we know it has been falling, right? But how you respond to it is where, where that, that courage comes in, I think. And I certainly believe it's where that creativity can be put to its best use. That's what I'm seeing. So I have to ask you, we had, a, uh, when I posted earlier in the week, um, I had a lot of people go, wow. And then uh, the one question I ask everyone, which I already had people ask me about you, what are you doing to stay positive? Because you're obviously a creative guy, a well-connected guy, a successful uh, human being. What are you personally doing? What are your some of your habits or some of the things that you have taken up or some of the things that you do to stay positive? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, from a motto perspective, mine has always been, it's not what happens, it's how you handle it. When, when, when life beats the socks out of you, uh, you know, which it has, you know, several times to me, um, you, you quickly realize it's not what happens, it's how you handle it. And I do believe that in every problem, there is an opportunity equal to or greater than the challenge. So uh, I, I start with that premise. Um, I'm not wondering if it's true. I, I know that it is. And um, uh, so my habits actually haven't changed much uh, other than I've had to work a whole lot more. Um, the, uh, you know, I, 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 because I work with other countries, uh, I used, they usually worked around my time frame. Now I'm working around some of theirs, um, and which means I, my phone starts going off at about three, between three and 4 a.m. every morning. Um, I have to be ready for video calls by about 4, uh, 4, 30, 4, you know, 4.45, something like that, uh, dealing with China and Africa uh, or Germany, Singapore, India, so forth. 
Um, and then uh, by the time they go to sleep, then everybody in America is woken up and wants to want you to work all day. And so uh, it's an interesting thing. But um, I spend about three hours in in uh, in silence in my personal devotion and faith every morning, uh, uh, two, two, two and a half to three hours. Um, uh, for a good portion of that, I will walk uh, while I'm doing that. Um, as it is so that I can get the the uh, the fresh air. Um, and I don't really view it as, as exercise as much as it's getting my brain uh, mobilized to the point that I can can uh, be sharp. I, my goal is to stay sharp 24 hours a day to the best of my ability. I need to be able to always be able to take a phone call and, uh, you know, answer something that, you know, could end humanity, right? The, the nuclear kind of issues. Uh, and really, in, in the artificial intelligence and the cybersecurity space that I play in now, um, that's a that's a real issue because the, there's only been three major inventions in human history uh, in warfare. Uh, ammunition was the first major advancement. Um, the second uh, is nuclear, uh, and then the third is artificial intelligence. And so uh, I want to always make sure that when I'm asked something in, in a moment, uh, what I say can sometimes uh, impact life uh, itself. And so I want to make sure that. You know, you know, what I don't do is drink. What I don't do is smoke. What I don't do is uh, do things that harm my body or harm my ability to think very, very crystal clear at all moments uh, possible. Um, I, I focus on my health. I eat uh, very, very, very clean. I don't cheat. Uh, uh, even on my birthday, I did not. I don't cheat. <laughs> I have Most people celebrate doing the wrong thing, which is very, I've never understood that really. Um, you don't lose weight and then celebrate by eating a piece of cake or ice cream. You, you, you then, you know, buy yourself a tie or buy some shoes, but do something, you know, but, uh, but make it a healthy habit. Um, so I get up early and I, I, I make sure my mind and my spirit and, and my soul are ready to meet whatever ha comes that day. And then I'm, then I'm working, you know, uh, constantly, uh, and then I get, I, I try to get the proper amount of sleep, uh, uh, you know, normally that would be uh, eight or nine hours. And in and, and these days it's, uh, you know, four to six hours. But I will tell you that the first week when this pandemic happened, I was working around the clock. Uh, in a 48 hour period, I got about an hour uh, to two hours total of sleep combined. Um, and that was pretty much, there was a handful of us that were working on the White House task force uh, supply list for the COVID supplies. And uh, we did not sleep uh, from beginning on a Monday until uh and saturday after afternoon late morning saturday afternoon is when we kind of rested for the first time wow yeah. you're amazing my friend um well, i would love blessed. to have you come back on the show i have a thousand more questions for you because when somebody comes on who's that multi has that multi-faceted background um you know i could have i have many questions about ai definitely yeah. about cybersecurity. So I'd love for you to come back on. Thank I'd you so much. Speak to your audience uh, with this uh, because right now I mentioned discernment, but there's there there's culture wars going on. There are economic wars, uh, biological wars, and, uh, and and cyber wars and information wars going on simultaneously. Normally we only handle one at a time. Uh, this is a, a multi-war front, and um, uh, so we we've especially the media focuses on one aspect of that, which is the coronavirus. But um, it's not, it doesn't minimize one war to focus on the other and acknowledge the other wars that are happening right now. Um, and I will, I will say that from literally day one, we knew, we knew uh, uh, being, you know, inside of the, the national security initiatives and so forth. Uh, uh, we knew that, uh, uh, this was not just about the coronavirus. Uh, the first uh, 24 uh, hours after this really hit, HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, had more cyber attacks than they've ever than, than any other than any of the other departments have had, um, and more than 9/11, more than any of it. It was in, it's been intentional because, with everyone having to work remotely. Hackers were now able to access corporate and government records that they never had access to before because everyone was inside the firewall and the perimeter. This was a we've got to do this in order to get that. Um, the, the cyber war is the real, really the real story. There's a lot. I mean, obviously, the economic is, is 
impact of this is is, is horrendous. But um, uh, the 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 national security interests of our entire infrastructure are what's really at stake in ways that this that our American people cannot understand. Uh, you watch things like um, "Live Free or Die Hard," I think it was the name of it, or you know those kind of things, and that pales in comparison when when our electric grid. You know, everyone's talking about the quarantine, but if I took cut of rice power this afternoon, which we could do, um, and all of a sudden our our food lines, um, you're you're already rationed on toilet paper and water and things. So we, you already are rationed. We cut off your power. We cut off your communication because we can uh, through through EMPs through uh, uh, other things where we can immediately control all of the communication waves. So now you're cut off uh, and you're quarantined, uh, and you start putting you know. National Guard on every corner with a with, with an M16. Uh, yet now you're starting to understand the world that uh, that 98 percent of the other the rest of the world understands. Uh, but what we've said it can't happen here. This past Friday, the uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, in conjunction uh, with home uh, with uh, the State Department and with the FBI, issued a joint statement that North Korea was uh, was an immediate cyber threat on uh, our entire the global financial system, uh, which means you know you could wake up and you not have a single dime in your bank account, all of your retirement accounts completely wiped out. Uh, the, the banks, you, you're completely helpless, okay? And so a, a country that we like to make fun of or think, you know, in our arrogance, American arrogance, that we are, we're just so much better than and so much, we, we, we are enlightened and we are the woke people. And, and then we've got people, you know, that can about to destroy our very fickle way of life, uh, very superficial way of life. And um, that's the real story that's happening right now. It, 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 uh, it was so grave that they had to issue a warning to, to some of us on Friday about this. Um, but if people think things are bad with this, they haven't seen anything yet. So the, the answer is not to be prepared for absolutely everything that comes your way. The answer is in complete surrender to whatever comes our way. This is who I am. This is whose I am. And this is the kindness that I'm going to treat people. This is how I'm going to communicate with people. And we can still be the kind of people and have the right attitudes and the right approach to life, uh, regardless of circumstances. So much food for thought. My brain is going a mile a minute. Um, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Roland Roberts for coming on the show. I always have to put the doctor on. I think it's so good to, <laughs> to give that respect and that shout out. Um, I would love to have you come back on. I know I already tagged you so people know how to reach you. I tagged you on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your insights and sharing what it's like and what we should be thinking about. I think it's so important to get those insights and you are, you're certainly on the inner circle of that. And um, I can't wait for people to watch this show because it certainly made got my mind going a mile a minute. Uh, but thank you for being uh, courageous and thank you for being uh, transparent. I re really, really appreciate that so we much. Thank you for what you do for our community as well. Thank you very Thanks, much. Dr. All right, Dr. Roberts, thank you very much. We'll see you guys later. Have a great one.